Welcome to 52 Miniatures, my name is Alex and this video is sponsored by World of Warships and so we're painting and building a miniature model warship. But what if this warship would be suddenly attacked by a Warhammer demon monster from the grim, dark and distant future, crushing the battleship in a big splash of Atlantic doom? I like stories, so I'll tell you one now, as well as try and build one in a miniature diorama format. This story is what we can call alternative history. I love working in this setting, not only for the imagination expanding possibilities, it also brings a great wealth of miniature models to the table. Because of the possibility to mix historical model making with sci-fi and fantasy model making and thus the possibility to mix scales. Creating larger than life dioramas. For the fun of it, I'm also going to mix painting approaches throughout this video, using techniques more commonly used in scale modeling on the historical model and a more tabletop war game model approach to the Warhammer model. We'll also be deep diving into water effects. I'll be moving fast at times, so please don't hesitate to ask me about specifics in the comments section below. Not long ago I acquired a copy of War Games Illustrated as a cure for the impending boredom of a long train journey. The mag came with a free mini, a little torpedo boat for cruel seas. I wanted to do something with this little model but didn't know quite what. Lo and behold, not long after, World of Warships reached out and wanted to sponsor a video. And well, here we are. I was already ahead of them, cruising past in my torpedo boat, wind in my hair, a salty taste in my mouth. Sort of. One quirk became apparent. I needed to use a model featured in the computer game. And so I did a little history research, found a ship with a fascinating history that also looks really cool and is available to play in the game, and ordered it from Warlord Games, the HMS Campbelltown. I kind of forgot to check the size though, it is kind of uh, larger than a free torpedo boat. You might be wondering why the gaming piece and not a scale model. Well, you might not be wondering, but I'm about to tell you anyway. Can you imagine the size of the bits? A 1 to 300th scale gun barrel. I'm just not going there. And so I thought I was being smart getting a solid resin model, and I kind of forgot about the lack of a hull. So I sanded everything down and cleaned up the model. By the way, make sure you're wary of resin dust if doing this kind of stuff. Wear a respirator, embrace the power of the vacuum cleaner, or, or true to the nature of the ship, sand it down underwater. I then proceeded to scratch build a hull using some blue styrofoam. I don't know if I saved any time in the end to scratch building a hull compared to getting a proper scale model with tiny, tiny bits. I do know I greatly enjoyed building this hull, and that in the end is what hobbies are here for. Using images rendered from the rather stunning 3D model of the HMS Campbelltown from World of Warships, I had a reference of what I should be going for with the shape of the hull. Carving the block of styrofoam that I had glued in place with white glue with my sharp snap blade knife was surprisingly easy. I then covered the entire hull with a layer of milliput epoxy putty. Mixing the putty with isoprop alcohol makes a paste that I could evenly spread and later on sand down, creating a smooth yet slightly worn hull. The reason for the milliput is to get this sanded smooth look, but also so that I can use super glue and various paints without having to worry about styrofoam reacting and melting like some kind of German soldier staring into the lost ark. This kind of milliput goo is great for gap filling Warhammer models too, by the way. Now before moving on to one of the coolest Warhammer 40k models around, let's have a look at World of Warships. World of Warships is a free to play PC and console game where you play and uh, hopefully, admittedly, unlike me, conquer the oceans aboard history's most iconic battleships. I kind of just cruise around and look at all the great looking ships and scenery, wondering why everyone around me is in such a rush. Don't get me wrong, it's a fun game. But I mean, the ships are designed based on historical documents and actual blueprints. Pretty cool and something I used as a resource throughout this video. World of Warships has more than 40 unique maps with dynamic, stunning water effects and textures. Hopefully what I'll have in my diorama by the end of this video. 
The game has a passionate and dedicated fan base. You can participate in tournaments, live streams and a Discord channel. New content is released every month, whether it's new ships, in-game nations, cosmetics or even ship classes, as well as updates such as Godzilla vs Kong, Transformers, Popeye or Megadeth collaborations. It's now World of Warship's 8th birthday and starting at the beginning of October, all active World of Warship players will have access to the exclusive Captain's Club where players can receive discounts and offers from partners like Razor. And so please go check out World of Warships. There's battleships, destroyers, aircraft carriers, cruisers, submarines, most probably for conquering the world, but seriously, even just to check out the great ship models. This makes me sound old, I know. There's a link to the game in the description down below. Please go press it. During registration, use the promo code BRAVO to receive a huge starter pack including 500 doubloons, 1.5 million credits, 7 days of premium account time and a ship. Now let's have a look at the destroyer of ships, Vashtor. Vashtor is a sort of demon of almost godlike status, kind of like Lemmy. I mean, this is the most metal mini of Warhammer 40k and I don't mean an alloy, I mean the music. Could you not imagine wearing a Vashtor t-shirt? Headlining Wacken Metal this year, Vashtor, a sort of machine demon. Good name for a song, that. Anyway, I bought this mini a while back just because I could not not buy it and because I wanted the wings for another project. Vashtor is the perfect model to be crashing this boat party. My plan for this is for Vashtor to sort of drop down from the sky, landing on the HMS Campbelltown and crushing it in half. But Vashtor's original pose is a bit more of a out for a Sunday afternoon stroll type pose. So I did some altering bringing a bit more of a spring to Vashtor's step and a bit more of a swing to Vashtor's arm. I also decided to not use much of Vashtor's plate armor. The arm replacement required gap filling and a bit of simple sculpting. I used a mix of 50-50 green stuff and milliput. Vashtor has this stringy muscular thing going, something that is kind of easy to replicate in epoxy putty. I'll be jumping back and forth quite a bit between monster and ship as my process did just that. A hobby project is seldom a perfect string of events, not mine anyway, more of a mix of I'd like to do something different now, or oh dear, that epoxy putty on Vashtor is going to take hours to dry, good thing I have lots of other bits to work on. Like this tiny crew. I mean, this is some serious small people with some seriously large pieces of flash on top. Cleaning that up was a little project in itself. Time to cut this boat in half. The HMS Campbelltown was in real life sacrificed during Operation Chariot in 1942. More on that later. Nevertheless, it felt kind of weird doing all that nice work on the hull to then just attack it with a saw. But once this was done, I could add hull details using plastic cards, some 3D printed propellers, toothpicks and small plastic pipes. Using the World of Warships 3D model as a visual guide. For those of you with a keen eye, you might notice a difference between my model and the computer game model. And they are indeed different. Originally, the American USS Buchanan, launched in 1919, was gifted to England in 1940 and thus renamed the HMS Campbelltown. By then, slightly obsolete, uh, thank you very much, but in my opinion, looking oh so good. After some modifications to fit the Royal Navy and some repairs after a few collisions, we have the ship as seen in the World of Warships 3D model. In 1942, the Campbelltown was modified to be used in Operation Chariot, altered to look slightly, at night, like a German torpedo boat. And that is the look that my resin model has. Same ship, a few years apart. Now for the water thing. I want all this to happen at sea. I mean, it's a ship, right? That's where they live. And so I'm going to use epoxy resin. It's my second time. My first was a disaster, as tends to be with the case of all firsts. And so I thought I should do a test pour of the resin as well as get some depth to the diorama ocean. Instead of using colored resin, I sprayed the underside of a transparent plastic sheet left over from a past river build, linked above, in a nice tropical turquoise. I'm going for this colour to kind of keep the fantasy feel going. Fantasy water is turquoise and historical water is more like Prussian blue. Uh, fact. 
I then, with the help of tape and hot glue, fastened sides made from the same type of plastic sheet, using UV resin on the inside to seal the seams, making everything watertight, or in this case, epoxy resin tight. And then I mixed and poured in some of my resin. A 24-hour curing clear resin from Green Stuff World, using a little creme brulee blowtorch to swiftly remove some of the air bubbles. Beware that this is nasty stuff. I used nitrile gloves and a respirator when working with resin, and I left it to cure in a separate room as the resin will release fumes while it cures. And finally, it's time to paint. The metal bits of the ship I glued in place, all the miniature crew I glued on some bases for easier handling. After giving them a scrub in water with a bit of washing up liquid, something I'd done with the ship as well at some point. Sometimes resin and metal minis can have residue of release agent on them from the molding process, and paint does not stick to that. I don't know if this is the case with this model, but I'm not taking any chances. Some barbecue skewers were used so that I could have some way of handling the ship while painting. I mean, this is no worse than cutting things in half with a saw. And then my demon and ship lollipops were primed black. As mentioned beforehand, I'll have what we can call a scale modeler's approach to painting this ship. I know some tabletop viewers stop watching when they see the airbrush. Please don't. Vastor will probably tickle your fancy more. And besides, I'm about to tell the fascinating history of HMS Campbelltown. So instead of leaving, please give this video a like. It really does help. In early 1942, the HMS Campbelltown, rigged with four tons of high explosive encased in cement to prevent any interference, set off towards the French coast, accompanied by a number of small ships carrying British commandos. The target was the German-held docks at Saint-Nazaire in France. The ship had been altered to resemble a German torpedo boat as well as refitted with anti-aircraft guns and extra armour to protect the bridge structure. Flying the flag of the German Navy in the cover of darkness, it made it almost all the way up the Loire River estuary before coming under fire. At 1.34, March the 28th, the HMS Campbelltown rammed the dock gate, while the accompanying commandos under heavy German fire set about demolishing the dock machinery. Of the survivors, about half managed to evacuate while the remaining were captured. At noon, Undetected by German forces, the time charges on the explosives aboard Campbelltown detonated, essentially destroying the dry dock, rendering it unusable for the rest of the war. And so the HMS Campbelltown ended its service as a battering ram rigged with explosives. It kind of makes me feel okay about the fact that I sawed her in half. This is fascinating wartime history that kind of makes some of the sci-fi Warhammer stories I've read seem unimaginative. And kind of makes me want to build another type of diorama, one with a dry dock in it. I've left plenty of details out, retelling this, so you can delve in a little deeper, if you like. But there we are. One of the reasons I like Warhammer and similar models is I don't have to deal with the realness of what must have been unimaginable. I mean, being on a 1,280-ton ship, ramming a steel and concrete wall sitting on high explosives while lots and lots of people are shooting at you is uh, incomprehensible. The Campbelltown that rammed the docks and later exploded did not have the 142 on her side as she was traveling incognito. But I really think a few decals like this makes a model look more interesting and so I applied them anyway. After a layer of gloss varnish that had dried, I brushed on micro set on the surface, placed the transfers that had been soaking in water and then brush over them with micro sole. After that has dried, I varnish again to protect the transfer. In this case, I varnished the entire model with the gloss varnish as preparation for an oil wash. I want the oil wash to run smoothly into cracks and crevices and a gloss varnish will help greatly. I'm testing out these pre-mixed oil washes from Modeler's World, the first time working with them, and so it's a little too early to pass judgment. These washes contain something more in the way of solvents than just white spirit, and the odor is rather powerful. As washes, they worked well and were a nice shade and flowy consistency to add depth and character to crevices and shaded areas. Using a combination of warm grey and cold grey oil wash, removing unwanted excess with some cotton buds, I then left them to sit overnight to dry. I then varnished again. 
this time with a semi-matte varnish. I mean, varnish is your friend. A lot of the time we think of varnish as protection used as a final step, but there's no reason not to use varnish during the painting process. I'll show you why I did it in a bit. I'm not painting Vashtor by the official colour scheme, a sort of pale skin and brass armour. I want something that'll stand out more, kind of like the 70s sci-fi book covers, the monster from space descending upon this suddenly quite surprised HMS Cameltown. Is it a bird? Is it a plane? No, it's Vashtor. My paint scheme is also an example of how it's a lot easier to feel free and experiment, at least for me, with a fantasy style model than it is with a scale model. I've no problem painting Vashtor the demon any colour of my choosing, blue skin, green skin, pink skin, whatever. Painting a historic model in whatever colour is a bit more difficult. My mind automatically wants to make the ship look like a real life replica, whereas the opposite goes for the demon. I sure can understand why the two different styles appeal to different hobbyists and at different times in life. Vashtor's armour and rusty metallic bits were mainly painted using a sponge and a little watered down paint, sort of stippling technique, followed by some glazing, a very thin down blue-grey to shade the green armour. The sponge stippling gives this great texture but is also surprisingly efficient on a large model. The skin was a traditional layering technique using uh, Caucasian skin tones, working from a rather dark Caucasian skin tone up to something rather pale, staining recesses with magenta as I go, resulting in this very modern flayed look, very fetching on your average demigod demon. In the middle of working on this skin, I did a cheeky spray of transparent purple from below on the entire model. I realised that a purple would be a great shader for both the green armour, the rusty metal and the skin. An efficient way of getting some shadows over the entire model. This was the only airbrush work done, but it could have been done with a regular brush. And neither will there be oil washes. I wanted to separate how I paint the two models in the diorama, so that in the end it really would look like that sci-fi magazine monster is crashing down on the historic ship. And when thinking about it, it's rather interesting how the different visual styles we've learned to appreciate have to some degree come to affect the way we paint and the techniques we use. While on that subject, here's a favourite technique. Dot filtering or what I like to call how to turn a dead flat surface into a living thing. This was the major reason for that second varnish. I'm protecting the previous oil wash, but also the semi-matte surface works better for me when doing this dot filtering than the previous glossy varnish. The glossy finish, however, was great to make the wash flow out nicely. I'm using varnish not only as protection between different layers of oil paint, I'm also using specific finishes to alter the flow of the oil paint and white spirit. Now that sounds fancy. Dot filtering, by the way, is as you can see, painting out small dots of different colours of oil paint. Colours that will complement and stain your surface. The thought is that dirt and grime has a lot more colour than we like to think. And by using several colours, streaking them out with a large soft brush, moistened in white spirit, into a thin filter, we will render a more naturally stained surface than just using a brown paint, for example. I'm using dark blue, green brown, brown and off-white, but the choice of colour definitely varies depending on what I'm painting. After that I use some more oil paint to do streaks and dirt and rust, and once dry I varnish everything one final time with a matte varnish. But this staining stage could go on forever. The model is simple and has a lot of flat surfaces that could be enhanced with colour and textures. But we are by now a few weeks into this project, and we still have an ocean to build. Videos like this one take a lot of time to make, it's probably down to all the layers of varnish. Uh, seriously, the first clips of this video were filmed on the 23rd of September, that was a month ago. Three of those four weeks I've been working on this project, including a few weekends. The only way this is possible is through the support of my patrons. And so if you think this video is cool and want to see more, then please consider supporting. There's a link in the description and at the end of this video. We need to get working on that ocean. And for that we need scientific data. Water moves in specific ways and to create a realistic water diorama one needs to study how water flows. Recreating the effect of a monster from 40,000 years into the future, stomping on a 1,200 ton ship, breaking it in half is of course a little bit tricky. But that 
is why you have creators like me to do the thinking and the smart equations. What I can conclude is that there is quite the splash, followed by quite the bouncy move from the boat, making it look like it's almost flying there for a second, uh, followed by water going everywhere, my slippers included. This little ship didn't break in half, of course, but I guess there's a limit to what you can expect from this channel. What follows is a total experiment, something you should definitely expect from this channel. So I've painted a few models, mixed a few oil washes in my day, placed a tough or two Water dioramas with resin? No idea. So this is me trying things out. One could argue that a good idea is to experiment on something like a test model, and not a ship with a scratch-built hull that's then taken a week to paint. For me, well, I just never get it done then. There'd always be room for improvement. I'd rather do as best I can and move on. The first resin pour worked out fine at least, so I was confident to move on. I needed to attach the ship somehow and used a piece of the same transparent plastic that I used for the surrounding walls. Using UV resin as glue, as super glue can cloud things. I then thought, if I add some streaky water now before the resin pour, it will look like there's all this stuff happening under the water's surface, water churning around and so forth. I used plastic from packaging. You know the blister style packs you get at game stores with brushes or mixing balls or whatever in them? Cutting strips of this stuff, heating them a bit to give them a wobbly shape, and we have a great armature for water effects. I covered these in UV resin, as well as the piece of plastic holding the ship in place, thinking it's the perfect camouflage. I then attached the other half of the ship to the first one, jamming in a piece of plastic into the soft foam core heart of the ship, and attaching that to the other half with the help of UV resin. Once more trying to cover everything up with even more UV resin to get some kind of underwater action. I then poured on the rest of my epoxy resin and waited for 24 hours for this to set. There was less of it than I thought. I would have liked a deeper pour or the ship to have been lower down, but there we are. Once cured, yeah, I put a little fellow there in the water. I came to the conclusion that the epoxy resin covered all the UV resin perfectly and rendered the UV resin invisible. Rather logical when you come to think of it. So now I have this completely clear piece of water with very visible plastic sheets in it. I should have just glued the ship straight onto the absolute first layer of resin and it would have looked like it was floating and not like a rather bad illusionist's trick. So then I thought, what if I put lots of splash gel and maybe even some wave foam on what I've got before I add more resin? Again, hoping to create a sense of depth and motion to the water. Splash gel is a wonderful thing. There's different types, clear, colored, opaque. I'm using a clear version. While this cures, it shrinks and twists into shapes that look very much like moving water. It does take about 24 hours to do so, though. A wave foam is like a putty that shapes easily into what one could imagine is the white crest of a wave. And same as with the splash gel, when drying it shapes itself into something rather like a foamy cresting wave. The one I used for Modeler's World, called Sea Foam, worked very well and can probably be used as a pretty good snow effect as well. Once the splash gel was cured, I started adding UV resin, building up small amounts bit by bit into this wild, splashy ocean. And once again, apart from the white from the sea foam, none of the previous effects were much visible. So I guess my lesson here is that if I want to add effects inside the water, they need to be colored or they will just disappear and become one with the later applied resin. I could now break off the walls of the container and I mean, it looks cool when seeing it like this. I just imagine more stuff happening in the water. Originally, my plan was to have some kind of a sea floor or maybe rocks and stuff sticking out of the sea, but I kind of wanted to try this simplistic approach out. I added some UV resin to where there would be water flowing on the ship and then totally covered everything in splash gel, trying to create this movement of water flowing off the ship down into the ocean. It's honestly kind of difficult trying to figure out what looks good here. I kind of like the very flowy feeling of the UV resin, but if we're thinking this is uh, as water in an ocean at 1 to 300 scale, then there would be lots of movement and ripples and waves and all sorts. As there was now another 24 hours to wait, I could finish Vashtor, a nice setting of edge highlights. This was a fun miniature to paint. It's so large, and that kind of makes things easier. There's more to paint, but it's all less fiddly. 
I'd have to say that this big Warhammer model probably didn't take me much longer than a regular sized Warhammer model would. And a last experiment. There was a major difference between the death metal doom from above and the HMS Campbelltown. And that was the attention to shading and shadows. The ship, because of the airbrush work and the washes and the streaking, has this real sense of cooler, deeper shadows and warmer, brighter highlights. Whereas Vashtor here is the same shade of flayed flesh all over. Sure, there was that instance of a little purple in the shaded areas, but it's not quite enough if compared to the ship. After being reminded by my friend Ninjon in a recent video he made about these AK interactive pencils, I thought I'd give the ones I bought a few years back a go, having completely forgotten that I had them. What Ninjon showed in his video was that when wet, the pencil would smear on paint quite nicely, and that this paint could then be moved around and even removed without much interference on the paint already there. And it does work very well. This green-blue was the perfect shade, and I could add paint to then feather out and even remove if I'd applied too much. Kind of like working with oil paint in a way, but without the need for white spirit. I really liked how this worked out, and I will be coming back for more. Especially since I realized you don't have to actually use the pencil at all, you can just scrape some off with a knife and use a brush as an applicator instead. If you don't have AK Interactive available to you, you can probably check out what your local art supply store has to offer. We're now doing the finishing touches. This has been quite the build and I forgot to tell you that you should have prepared with a beverage and a biscuit beforehand, sorry. The splash gel looks great. There's all this water action going on now. I added sea foam, imagining that the sea would be kind of foamy at a time like this. Not utterly convinced how this looked in the end. The clear water effect was kind of cool. Not realistic, but cool. And cool would probably have suited this mashup of styles better. But there we are. With Vashtor glued in place, the final step was to gloss varnish the sides of the resin block, hiding any scrapes and such that happened along the way of the build. The last layer of varnish, I promise. What a scene, and thank you for getting through the process of building it together with me. I'll be honest and say that working with resin is a hassle. It probably looks cool, but it's a lot of work with a toxic material that takes a lot of preparation and consideration. I'm not trying to dissuade you, but I'm not sure how majorly different this would have been if it was done on a flat piece of plexiglass with just a lot of splash gel or something. I think if I would have added more stuff happening in the water, maybe a seabed or lots of debris floating around or something, th there would have been more of a point to all the resin. On the other hand, it does look cool. And especially at a distance, there's this glow effect happening. As I said, this channel is most of the time about me journeying through my own hobby process. And there's always the next build, paint job and diorama to move on to. And now I'm a little bit wiser. A great thank you to World of Warships for sponsoring this video. Don't forget to check out the game itself linked in the description. And don't forget the promo code BRAVO to receive the starter pack and freebies. A great thank you for watching. And to my patrons for supporting my endeavors in many layers of varnish. Please like and subscribe. Bye.